They thought the horror had already happened. They thought the explosion that tore Reactor 4 apart was the disaster. The moment the fireball lit up the night sky, the world believed the worst was over. A single blast. A single meltdown. A single nightmare frozen in smoke and graphite and the screams of men running across a burning roof. But that belief was a lie. Because the truth was far darker. The real catastrophe hadn't struck yet. It was forming beneath their feet, growing in silence gathering power in a place no one could see. While the flames roared above, while radioactive smoke drifted over Pripyat like a poisoned fog, something far more dangerous was happening in the depths of the reactor building. Something no one understood at first. Something so catastrophic, it would have changed the map of Europe forever. What the world didn't realize was that Chernobyl was seconds away from a second explosion one so violent, so apocalyptic, that the first blast would have seemed like a spark in comparison. A second explosion powerful enough to vaporize the remaining reactors, to tear through Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, to send radioactive ash hundreds of kilometers into the air, to poison the soil of half a continent, to make places like Kiev and Minsk uninhabitable for thousands of years. It was an explosion that would have killed millions, and it almost happened. Deep inside the basement of the reactor, hidden beneath the layers of shattered concrete and twisted metal, was a chamber filled with water. Not clean water. Not contained water. Standing water from emergency systems. Water that had flooded through broken pipes and damaged channels when the reactor ruptured. A massive underground reservoir sitting directly beneath the white-hot core that had already melted through floors. Workers did not know how much fuel had fallen. They did not know how hot it still was. They did not know the molten corium was dripping toward the water like acid falling toward a bomb. All they knew was that the meters were failing, the radiation was rising, and the building was changing shape hour by hour. Above them, the core was melting. Below them, the water was waiting. If the molten nuclear fuel reached that water, it would not just boil. It would flash into steam instantly, and that instant would create a pressure wave, an explosion, so powerful it would tear through the remaining reactor structures like paper. The other three reactors at Chernobyl would detonate in a chain reaction. All the graphite, all the fuel, all the radioactive debris would be blasted into the sky at once. One scientist later said, it would have removed Belarus from the earth. Another said, we would have lost Europe as we know it. They were not exaggerating. The men working above had no idea. To them, the danger was the fire, the graphite, the radiation burning their skin and lungs. They believed the battle was happening on the surface, but beneath them, something ancient and unstoppable was forming. Water and molten core, two forces that should never meet. Only a handful of engineers understood the truth and when they realized the danger, their blood ran cold. They raced through the ruined control rooms, through the smoke-filled stairwells, through the radio chatter of men dying on the roof. They brought their findings to the officials who had gathered in the plant's bunker, their faces gray with exhaustion and fear. We need to drain the water, the engineers said. If we don't, the reactor will explode again. How long do we have? someone asked. Hours, came the answer, maybe less. But the valves that could drain the reservoir were underwater, deep underwater. In the flooded basement where radiation levels were catastrophic, levels that would kill a man in minutes if he stayed too long. The corridor leading to the valves was pitch black. The water was radioactive. The metal beams had started to sag. The air stung with particles that shredded flesh and DNA. Someone needed to go down there. Someone needed to swim into that darkness. Someone needed to risk a death so horrific that even the doctors later struggled to describe it. It was a suicide mission. Everyone in the room knew it. Three men stepped forward. Alexei Anonenko, Valery Bezbolov, Boris Baranov. They did not hesitate. They did not negotiate. They did not ask if they would survive. They simply nodded, took their equipment, and prepared to walk straight into hell. 
not because they were fearless, but because they understood what would happen if they didn't. The three men descended into the basement with only flashlights, rubber suits, and the sound of water sloshing around their boots. The radiation meters screamed at them. Their lights flickered as the electromagnetic chaos of the reactor interfered with the circuits. The air smelled metallic, bitter, wrong. Their bodies felt heavy, their movements slow, as if the building itself was trying to hold them in place. They waded deeper, the water rising past their knees, then their thighs. Their flashlights cast narrow cones of light through the darkness. Every shadow looked alive. Every drip of water echoed like a warning. They knew the molten core was somewhere above them, still glowing, still burning, still capable of falling through the floor like a blade made of fire. If the ceiling collapsed, they would die instantly. If their suits tore, they would die painfully. If their lights failed, they would die blind. Minutes passed like hours. Then something happened that still frightens people who hear the story. Their flashlights died. All three at once. Not dimmed. Died. Pitch black. Absolute darkness. The water around them rippled as they panicked for a moment, each trying to breathe quietly, each listening for the ceiling above. But in that darkness, one of them heard something else. A soft hiss. The sound of air escaping a pipe. He reached toward it. His fingers found the cold surface of a valve wheel. He shouted to the others. Together they grabbed the wheel with trembling hands and began to turn. But it didn't move. They gritted their teeth, leaned with their full weight, and twisted. Slowly, painfully, it gave. The first valve opened. The water began to drain, swirling around their legs in growing currents. They moved to the second valve, turned it, opened it. Water rushed out faster. They worked in total darkness, surrounded by radiation that could kill a man ten times over. The pipes groaned as the reservoir began to empty. The floors trembled. The building shifted. But the explosion never came. The meltdown never reached the water. The world never ended, because three men, with failing lights and lungs burning from invisible poison, turned the wheels that saved millions. When they emerged from the basement, dazed, soaked, exhausted, the others stared at them as if they had returned from the dead. And in a way, they had. They were carried to medical units, their faces pale, their hands trembling. No one knew if they would live. Some reports say they died days later, Others say they lived for years. The truth is tangled in conflicting documents, rumors, and Soviet secrecy. But one truth is undeniable. Without them, the second explosion would have happened. And if it had, everything would be different. The forests of Europe would glow at night. The rivers would run radioactive. Cities would sit empty for centuries. Millions would have vanished. Maps would have been redrawn around an uninhabitable scar. Chernobyl was not a single disaster. It was a disaster that was stopped. Not by luck. Not by politics. But by three men walking into pitch black water, knowing exactly what awaited them. The world remembers the explosion. The fire. The flames. The graphite on the roof. The death that spread on the wind. But the world forgets the second explosion the one that almost ended everything. And the men who stopped it are the reason we are still here.